Right. Has any celebrity ever lived life as large as Frank Sinatra seemed to do it? I've got the world on a string and I'm sitting on a rainbow. One of the most influential artists of the 20th century, he cleared the way for every teen idol from Elvis to the Beebs. Now throw in a tempestuous love life, a few mobster pals, shenanigans with the Rat Pack, and Francis Albert Sinatra was every inch an icon. Now just imagine if that icon was your father. Where would you fit in? Would you follow in the old man's footsteps? Would you do your own thing? That has been the lifelong reality for Frank Sinatra Jr. It hasn't always been easy. His parents split when he was just a kid. There was a messy public divorce, and when he was 19, he decided to set out on his own musical career. But then something extraordinary happened. He was kidnapped at gunpoint and held for a few days in Los Angeles. Dad paid the ransom, the kidnappers were caught, but the experience did not deter Frank Jr. He continued to perform. And then I think I'll wait until the evening gets late and I'm alone with you. Then in 1988, Frank Sr. asked his son to be his musical director, and it was a chance for him to connect with his father, who would die a decade later. And now Frank Jr. has found a new way to pay tribute to his pops with a concert tour. Sinatra sings Sinatra. It is self-explanatory, and I'll save you the pun of him doing it his way. Thanks for coming on, man. Well, thank you for inviting me to your show. How's things? Things are pretty good. Yeah. Um, Sinatra sings Sinatra. That's got. A, that's the best title ever. Well, that's what they decided to call my show some years ago. Yeah. Did yeah. you be a certain stage of your life where you like where you had to? Reconnect with the identity of who your father is and what it is to be. I mean, you have the same similar name, right? In terms of Franklin as opposed to Francis, but to be a Frank Sinatra and to be a singer, to be that, did you have to take time to really come to terms with that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. As a matter of fact, looking back on it now, because I'm nearly seventy, I have to think I couldn't have picked a worse move as a vocation in my life. As a matter of fact, <laughs> well, you know, of we course, had... when I made that decision, I was eighteen and knew everything. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> when you decided at eighteen, did it come? Like, why did you, just because this is where you, your heart was taking you? No, wanted... no, 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 it was kind of an accident. I was a piano player, and I wanted to write songs and uh, play piano and things like that, which was what I was trained in from the time I was a little boy. And uh, one day I got drafted into singing uh, because the singer with the group I was playing with got drunk somewhere and didn't show up. And uh, the leader of the band, who was a taskmaster, he looked at all the guys and said, somebody's got to sing tonight. And he said, I need a volunteer. And he pointed at me, he said, you. I said, why me? I'm the piano player. He said, well, your name is Sinatra, isn't it? And I said to him, being Sinatra doesn't make me a singer any more than <laughs> being in a garage makes me a car. He said, don't be funny. Don't be funny. Get up here. And what? So it kind of happened by accident. And there you go. Oh, yeah, and there I went. Yes. <laughs> right you are. How would you characterize your relationship with your dad? Um, it was not really very extensive because he was doing his thing all the time I was growing up, and then when I became an adult, he was doing his thing and I was doing my thing. Right. But beginning in 1988, uh, which was the beginning of the final years that he was giving concerts, I was his conductor. Mm -hmm. I was his music director. He was past 70 then, and I would go into his dressing room to give him the menu of the songs. And I knew that he was tired, and I would say to him something. I said, hey, Pop, there's a woman in the audience who's real hot for you. <laughs> and he'd go, what? I'd say that she's going to give you the Tom Jones treatment. He says, the what? what's the Tom Jones treatment? I say, well, you've heard my stories about Tom Jones in Las Vegas. Women were throwing bras and panties and hotel keys up on the stage. And he'd say, she's going to do that to me? And I said, well, somebody fitting, more a pair of support hose, a hearing aid, <laughs> you know, things. And he'd say, oh, ha, 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 that's just real funny. <laughs> but I'd get his heart started. Yeah, well, I sure would do it, wouldn't he? <laughs> ah, right. And he'd come out and do a bang-up show, and he'd look at me. He'd turn around and he'd look at me, and I would give him this. Get in there and fight, fight. Mm -hmm. Because he was, like, you know, all of us. That's the ultimate destiny of all of us. And that was when the relationship became really strong. I must have meant an awful lot. 
Yeah. It meant an awful lot to me because of the fact that um, it's, you know, the father-son thing uh, can be difficult at best. Uh, primarily, as a boy, every one of us, we need our father. Yeah. Now the shoe was on the other foot. At that point, he needed me. And that's what made it so endearing, in fact. Well, see, I don't really know my father, but I had my uncle. And my uncle was this incredibly strong role model in my life. When, when your father was away... Did he wear red socks? My uncle? <laughs> you know what? He might have. <laughs> huh? That's what I'm talking about. These are Sinatra You're socks. You're in good company. With the Red Sox? <laughs> Van Johnson, oh, nice. the actor, years ago, was, was noted in those great days of the movies in Hollywood, the guy that always wore red socks. Dynamite, every You know night. who else who wore red socks? Mm. My guardian angel in television, Jack Webb. He yeah, wore red socks. There you go. Yeah. I, got, I thought you were going to say Stalin, and that was going to be bad. No. <laughs> no. You remember Jack Webb? You remember yeah, Dragnet? Remember. Yeah, of course. Yeah, well, Jack Webb wore, wore red socks. Because... Well, because people have such a strong relationship with him, did you ever resent the fact that people had this relationship with your dad and you didn't? Mm -mm. No, there was no need for resentment. The fact is, I've had trouble through the years trying to explain, especially to a lot of media people. The unfortunate thing is when the legend becomes bigger than the person, you lose the person. And this is, um, this is not good. Mm -hmm. Now, it's great to be famous and all kinds of things like that, but when the legend supersedes the person, that's unfortunate. Well, it's unsustainable, isn't it? I don't know. I've never thought about it. It's a good question. But I'm just thinking that there is a, there is a person behind all of this... Um, all of this uh, uh, hoopla that goes on and everything, and I think it, it would behoove us in dealing with people to deal with the person. The legend will always be there. All you have to do is pick up a tabloid, and you can see that. You hear the, the tabloids are different today, but, I mean, tabloids, you, you experience tabloids. All the kid. time. I mean, I, I, I mean, you were kidnapped, man, and the tabloids were there right mm -hmm. after that. Sure. Let's, let's play a clip of this. I mean, how do you feel when you see this now all these years later? You were scared? I was scared. I was a little bit nervous, naturally, but uh, the only thing I could do is hope for the best. What right. Right. You, fellas, right. do you mind Over if here. we go now? Because I want All to right. feed him. <laughs> okay, honey. Give her a big kiss, why don't you? <laughs> I love that moment. I can't believe all the hair I once had. <laughs> <laughs> what is Gloria? What, were you 19 at that time, roughly? Yeah, right. Yeah. I was not yet 20, and here I would. I didn't realize I had that much hair. <laughs> you ever look back at those days and go, what a life I've had? Um... Frankly, in that kind of an experience, I was pretty convinced that life, as you put it, was about over. So you really did think that? Oh, yeah, yeah. But the fact is, um, there were other people who said other reasons um, later when it came to that. Some sage philosophers, the great American benefactor of all well wishes, Don Rickles. He said, the only reason the kidnappers let him go is because they heard him humming in the trunk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Rickles. Ah, that was typical Don Rickles. You know. He still pulls that off. What a man. He, the things that they have done to him to get even with him. I remember one night, he was on the stage doing his thing in Las Vegas, and Sinatra came in, and he went to one of the trumpet players... And he took a cup mute from a trumpet and went over to Rickles and opened his mouth and stuck the mute in it and walked off. <laughs> Didn't help. No, nope. Didn't help. No. <laughs> <laughs> Out and keep coming the jokes. That's right. You know, in this interview, when you were talking about going to your dad to rile him up in the dressing room, you called him Pops. But when you say his name, you say Frank Sinatra. You call him Sinatra. Is, is, did you always refer to him like... No, there's two people. On occasions like this, when they're talking about the professional, that's Sinatra. At home... That's pop. That's pop. Mm -hmm. If you go this Saturday, Casino Ram near Aurelia, Ontario, home of another great Canadian songwriter, Gordon Lightfoot, uh, you can see uh, Frank do Sinatra, sings Sinatra. Frank Sinatra Jr., everybody, we'll be right back.